I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. Greg Brock never liked the limelight, but the self-described sissy boy from Mississippi didn't get a choice. From the moment he was born in 1953, it was clear he was different. And the way he was different brought him the kind of attention no one wants, from bullies, gay bashers, and a disappointed father. But that didn't keep Greg from excelling in a profession where just being himself made him a role model and trailblazer at some of the most important newspapers of the time. The Charlotte Observer, The Washington Post, and by 1987 at the San Francisco Examiner, where he was the assistant managing editor in charge of page one. In the world of journalism back then, an out gay person at that level of the business was a really big deal. Greg was also a driving force behind a 16-day series in the San Francisco Examiner called Gay in America. It was published for the 20th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. No one had done anything like it at any news outlet before. When I met Greg in 1989, it was rare to find anyone working in mainstream journalism who was gay and out. The reason was simple. For most people in most places, it was a career killer. I learned that lesson myself as a young producer at CBS News. In 1988, I was told by a senior executive that they'd never put an openly gay news person in front of the camera. I left CBS soon after to write my book, Making Gay History. So here's the scene. I've traveled from my apartment on Russian Hill in San Francisco to Greg's office downtown on Mission Street. It's just a couple of months since the publication of Gay in America, and Greg is getting ready to leave the examiner to go back to the Washington Post. He's a little guy with bright blue eyes, a round face, and a sweet smile. He's a few days shy of his 36th birthday. Except for his tie, Greg and I are dressed almost identically in journalist drag, pressed shirts and khakis. We're a long way from where Greg grew up, the tiny town of Crystal Springs, Mississippi, in the segregated South. As I clip the microphone to his shirt and press record, he takes me back to where he was born. I mean, I was a sissy boy from the word go. I played with dolls. I took baton lessons. I uh, was a mama's boy. Effeminate. I was a pretty, pretty little boy. As a child, I was really huge blue eyes and was very soft and very pretty. In fact, my birth certificate, I was marked as a girl. And that was always a running joke at family reunions. My dad, that's the only thing he ever said, well, it took him years to figure out otherwise. <laughs> I'd go home and cry myself to sleep a lot of nights. Huge white antebellum home, columns all the way around it. Um, in that town, the context of that town, probably upper middle class. We had money that a lot of people didn't, though we didn't have the old family name, which is really what counts there. Um, mother, father, three children, nice car. You know, you see, you get the scene. Uh, we went to church every week, and we did everything you were supposed to do, except under that roof, there was nothing. There was no love, there was no interaction, there was no nothing. You know, my dad wanted me to play football and do all these things. Um, he was a very masculine, very blue-collar type. And, um, you know, I didn't do anything the other boys my age did. I didn't like to hunt. I didn't like to fish. My dad took me to deer camp once. Deer camp being this place that he and all of his buddies had, they belonged to. Where it's kind of an old house, and about 30 men go, and they have bunks, and they have two black women who cook them meals, and they go out in the woods and kill deer. So I went, I don't remember how old I was, 10, 11. I didn't have a gun or anything, got me a gun. And I was like, I wasn't going to kill a deer. <laughs> you know, God, I was just awful, just disastrous. You must have felt like you were dropped on the planet from, mm -hmm. from somewhere in outer space. Yeah. Every year you got further and further away from your family. One time I went home and they always put it in the paper, you know, the weekly paper about who visited whom and who's home and all this kind of stuff. And I was in the personals column. My mother had put it in there that the Greg Brock, editor to the Washington Post, had been home to visit. <laughs> you know, I started to tell Ben Bradley he had been, you know, booted out. Right. But again, not quite ever getting it. What is the name of your town again? Crystal Springs. Crystal Springs, Mississippi. Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many people? Forty-five hundred, okay. roughly. Mm -hmm. So um, about twenty miles south of Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, since we're on this, I might as well tell you, I've, I came out last year on the Oprah Winfrey show to them. 
You were one. Were you one yeah. of the? You were the one. I was the one from Mississippi. Yeah. Coming, my, this is coming out day, 1988. Right. With October Indi 11th. The National Gay Rights mm -hmm. Advocates mm -hmm. planned this. They called me up, and I said, "Why would I do that? Everybody in the world knows I'm gay. If they want to know it, I'm very open about it." And so, what about your family? And I said, "Gulp." So all they were doing is submitting my name, though. But I knew it was a given that I was going to make it because my dad and Oprah Winfrey are from the same hometown in Mississippi, Kosciuszko, Mississippi. The producer interviewed me and talked to me. So, well, we'd like to fly up tonight and do the show in the morning. I said, well, you, you know, but the deal is you call your parents and tell them. And would you ask them if they would consent to a telephone hookup? So, oh, my God. This is a little dramatic. Oh, yeah. Is. So I called my dad. Uh, it was a Monday afternoon, right. October 10th. I've never felt so alone. Just my knees started shaking. There's just no way to describe it. I was scared. I was. I just didn't know. And you're a grown man right now. And I was a grown man. I was 35 years old. And you know, you call your dad. You know, and it's a Monday afternoon. His he's semi-retired and he has his little business kind of next to his house now and he gardens a lot. Oh, I just had this mental image of what he was doing. I could see his little house. They live out in the country. Um, Mississippi, you know, things, some things don't change. You go out and check the mailbox every day, and you get a, a letter from long distance, you know, across the miles. That's really a big deal. Or when a long distance phone call comes. I've been out there, and I know what it's like when you get the phone call that someone's died, or this has happened, or that's happened. And that's about what I was about to do to him. I was about to, on a Monday afternoon, October 10th, sort 1988. of 1988, shatter his life. Your father picks up the phone. <laughs> My mother, stepmother picks up the phone. Uh -huh. Oh, well, we're out in the garden, you know, the whole bit. Did I you dial more than once? No, just once. So I asked to speak to Daddy, and I said, you know, he, she said, let me get him. I said, well, you stay on the phone, too. So immediately my voice, I said, well, there's something I, you know, I want to tell you all, and been wanting to do this for a long time, just never has been appropriate. And so my voice started cracking, breaking. She said, well, honey, that's all right. What is it? I said, well, I guess the way, best way to say it is the good news is I'm going to be on the Oprah Winfrey show tomorrow. <laughs> and she says, oh, well, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I'll have to watch it. And I said, well, I'm not sure you're going to invite the neighbors over. <laughs> so that kind of broke the ice a little bit. And I chuckled and kind of got my voice back. I said, that's the news, but I said, it's the, the type of show she's doing. I said, since I've been out in San Francisco, I said, um, I'm sort of moved into the public eye a little bit. There have been some feature stories written about me, or a feature story. And I said, a lot of people know me here now. And I said, there's a reason for that. And I said, I can't mail you these articles, clip them out. I said, I'd like to. I'd like to share it with you. And I'd like to think that you, you know, this would be in the same vein as when I was in, at Ole Miss, and I was got awards, and I was this. And, you know, we always got the newspaper clippings and put them in the scrapbook. But I said, you know, I guess my fear is that you wouldn't put these clippings in the scrap in your scrapbook. And I said, the reason is, I said, in this city, I'm very well known because I said, for years now, at newspapers I've worked at, um, I said, I am gay, and I'm very open about it, but I've never told John. And I was just waiting. I can't remember the precise conversations and the reactions, but I remember my dad saying, well, that he had prayed a lot, that his suspicions were wrong. And then we went on to talk, and I, you know, it was kind of teary, but he really opened up and he talked a great deal, and I was surprised. And he even said that he, if they called him, he would talk to him on the telephone, which stunned me. Uh, they didn't. They ended up choosing my mother. What kind of reaction had you expected from him? Hang up. Oh. Um, tell me not to ever come home again. Didn't want to hear from me or whatever. Um, but they said, you know, that they loved me. and. Um, wanted me to come home, visit him, and stuff like that. That made it easier calling my mother, but I couldn't reach her. So I was already in Chicago at the hotel <laughs> before I finally got a hold of her. And that was, again, just the opposite of what I expected. I told her, and she didn't say much. Uh, I thought she'd start crying and falling on the floor and, you know, whatever. Um, she was pretty low-key about it. And... <laughs> It went into the typical Mississippi thing about, which I'd heard for years, well, you know, I've got black friends, too, <laughs> where she said, well, I know, son, you know, there are these two lesbians that come in the store all the time, and they're just as nice as they can be. And um, short conversation, she didn't say much. 
but and said she talked to the Oprah people. They called her. So the limo picks me up. And I go down there. Are you nervous at all? Oh, um, not really. Uh -huh. She's done the worst part. The worst part was over. It's an all-gay audience been handpicked by gay rights people. There are parents of gays. The P flag people flag, were yeah. there. So it was a friendly audience, and um, the the format was the first five minutes. Oprah says it's National Coming Out Day. People's lives today will be changed. But they're about to tell people. So they start popping up in the audience at Mike, saying, Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Something I've been wanting to tell you, I'm gay. Uh, hi, Cousin Sid. You know, you've made me feel really uncomfortable at all these family reunions, and I just wanted you to know I'm gay. It was great. And uh, then she took us one by one and did our individual stories. So she started talking to me and the whole bit. And we Really, she really got into the Southern routine. You know, it was great. And uh, that made me that much more comfortable. And then, you know, just she's reading cue cards, and she said, well, we have Greg's mother, Mrs. Sharp, on the phone. She's remarried, was remarried. That's the second <laughs> part of the Oprah story. And um, my mother's very Southern, very country, sort of, soft-spoken. And uh, <laughs> she said, Mrs. Sharp, are you there? And she said, yes, I am. <laughs> And so I'm saying that, not, I should have thought, what are they going to do with the camera? This is a voice being piped in the studio. It's either on me or <laughs> Oprah, right? You didn't think about that. And she starts talking, and she said, well, M Mrs. Sharp, what have you been thinking since Greg called you last night? Well, she said, I haven't gotten a wink of sleep all night. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself? And she said, I could hear how distraught she was in her voice. She sounded pretty cool about it the night before. Well, oh, she was in shock. She was in shock. She called my little sister and my plumber, redneck plumber brother-in-law. And I, I was sure that, like, they had been up all night and the family was just in a tizzy. I mean, they live for these things in the South, you know. Crises is what gets a Southern family one day to the next. And so Oprah says, well, like, what did Greg say when he called you? Did he ask you about your gardening and how the weather was? Or did he just, let it, like, lay it on you and say, well, I'm gay? And she said, well, he just laid it on me. So they talked back and forth. And she did tell Oprah she had never suspected. And I just, like, made this <laughs> horrendous face. I heard, heard made my dad really mad that she said that. And, um, because she had, in fact, suspected. Oh, they talked course. about it. Oh, of course. Hell, she would gotten me to take baton lessons at age five. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So, then she talked about her dad and how he had married late in life, and she thought with my career and everything that I would eventually get around finding the right person and settling down. And Oprah said, you mean the right woman? And she said, yes, the right woman. But she ends by saying, you know, she says, but the bottom line is that he's my flesh and blood and my only son, and I love him. And the audience just burst out into applause. It was right, very nice. And then they, she talked to me some more, you know, Oprah did. And uh, yeah, it was quite an experience. But then four days later, so I come back to San Francisco, that was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and she calls me. She said, well, your sister said you were going to call me this weekend, wait a few days. But she said, I want to call and tell you that, you know, it's been a rough week, son, and I haven't been here anywhere in a long time. So John, that was my stepfather, is going to take me down to New Orleans just to get away. I said, well, that's good. Y'all should go. Enjoy yourselves, get some rest. I'll talk to you when we get back. Saturday morning, the my machine has a message, hysterical message from my little sister <laughs> that my stepfather has dropped dead of a heart attack in New Orleans. <laughs> oh my God. I immediately pick up the phone, I call my ex lover who I talk to every day still, and I says, My stepfather just dropped dead with a heart attack and I know it's gonna be my fault. So sure enough, <laughs> uh, there was that discussion in the family. Well, he just broke his mama's heart. And my step, not no matter that my stepfather had one lung, one kidney, and it had four heart attacks. Uh, you know, just he just watching uh, Greg's mama just with a broken heart, and he just couldn't stand the strain. Just killed over with a heart attack. And then his mother, by the time they got his body back to Mississippi, his mother had died. <laughs> so they had a double funeral. And, and I said in the South, there's nothing better than a double funeral, than a double wedding than a double funeral. I mean, they love those, you know. They had matching casket pieces and buried them side by side. <laughs> so I have a great book, and me too, but uh, when they all die off. Oh. So, um, so you, I didn't go back. Oh, no, mm -mm, no way. I decided my absence would be best. <laughs> uh, I had caused enough stir that week. Because I'd love to have known what that little town was saying. They were in quite a stir, and all the ladies were calling each other. Well, I always knew what they said. 
I just always knew he was queer. <laughs> this must have changed your life in some way. Yeah. <laughs> it started my life, I think, on uh -huh. a lot of levels. Uh, living a lie, mm -hmm. not, not being yourself, not being open, carrying this tremendous burden around. Um, whoo, it's, it's a burden lifted. And now it's Yes, now it's theirs. <laughs>